All right, welcome everybody to the Make with H2O overall webcast program. Uh, this is our first one rolling out and we're doing H2O AI Cloud. I'm Reed Maloney, I run marketing for H2O. Vinod, my illustrious colleague, is gonna introduce himself. Hey, this is Vinod Ayengar, Vice President of Products at H2O. Really excited to be here and kick off this new series. Absolutely, we got we got a ton for you today. We're gonna drive in. Uh, if, if you know us really well from the open source or using our AI Cloud, uh, we have a lot of new innovation to share. We're going to be running through everything that's available uh, in the H2O AI cloud as part of the overview today. Uh, and Vinod's got a, got a couple demos planned uh, that we'll be hitting, hitting along the way. We also want to get a lot of feedback, not just from this session, but from the program in general, from our broader community that's out there. So we have a few polls. We ask you to participate. It'd be great for us to keep getting information. You know, we want to provide the information that you need. We want to be providing the platform and the functionality and the features that you need to be really successful in your day-to-day. -day. And so that, that's another big part of the goal of this overall program is not just education, but listening and getting that feedback back. Uh, as part of that, there is a, both a chat and a Q&A window overall. You know, if you can put your questions in the Q&A, it helps us track whether we've answered them or, or brought them to you. Uh, and we do plan on leaving some time at the end of the cast today to be able to answer those questions. All right, so with that, we're gonna start with the, with the first poll here. That should pop up on your screen in just a moment. There you go. So if you could just quickly answer what your favorite products look like. Give us a sense of, of, of what you know out there and what we're gonna drive into. Um, and then we also have some sessions uh, following up on this one that will go deeper into some of the, some of the specific products and some overall uh, technology topics. Give everyone just another minute here. All right. We got, well, we definitely have a mix going on between uh, between driverless and, and H203 is sort of the top there's torch there. Awesome. It's good to see those, that usage there. All right, Blair, let's move, um, let's move on on this one. Okay, great. So H2O has, is really a community powered company. We have over uh, 200,000 community and companies using H2O and that's led to a really strong uh, enterprise adoption where we have over 200 of the Fortune 500 uh, using H2O on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lot of our our growth has been driven by you know, us interacting with the community, listening to data scientists, hearing what they need, and then layering in some of the top data science talent to help us on uh, the features and products that we're developing. And so we have some of the top world's Kaggle grandmasters, and we use that expertise within uh, the products that we build, the recipes, the applications, some of these things we're gonna be talking about today that go into uh, having really optimized solutions that can be used to accelerate um, uh, on a, on a whole set of use cases. And so we have use cases across multiple industries that we've worked on. We've worked on hundreds, thousands of use cases across financial services, healthcare and life sciences, telecom, marketing and retail with customers like AT&T. And if you were watching on, uh, on the videos at the start, also things like, um, like, uh, like CBA on financial services and Wells Fargo. And so we've done things from a hey, preventative maintenance, uh, all the way to fraud, and then all the way back on the on the marketing side to how do you do spend optimization and personalization as you bring all that together. And so, sort of regardless of what the industry or use case is across the set of products that we have available with our AI cloud, really able to go and jump in and help with our customers and have the technology to help them very rapidly solve these really important business problems to drive value. And so when we think about value within those use cases, I mean, we have customers that have made over $100 million a year more by just increased trading profits in terms of how they're doing bond trading. You know, in terms of insurance underwriting, $20 million in annual savings, iPhone fraud, nearly a billion dollars of savings, collusion fraud, over a billion dollars of savings. These are huge numbers. Preventative maintenance, where they've taken their the, the regular scheduled maintenance they would have needed to have done and dropped that by 30% in their overall costs, but also then 
the, the main, uh, some of the main elements is service to their customers. So they're able to increase the service to their customers by being able to predict maintenance before it happens. Uh, targeted marketing campaigns, at really going after the right audience at the right time with the right campaign. And when this is multiplied by some of the largest budgets in the world and some of the, some of the largest digital media groups, this comes together and has just huge impact. So um, medical referrals is another one you might've heard UCSF talk about. We'll talk about that a little bit more today, but really across these industries and use cases, what we're really focused on is not just AI for the sake of AI, but AI to drive business value, or if in your government and nonprofit organization, it's, it's really to drive mission and mission accomplishment. All right, so why AI clouds? Why is there this investment? Why are everyone talking about AI clouds right now? There's, there's, there's a few main reasons, which is the age of AI is now. 85% um, of executives say they won't achieve their growth objectives without scaling AI. 71% in the state, 75% globally say they think they risk going out of business without being able to scale AI in the next five years. And so when we look at AI clouds, they're, they're, what we're finding is they're helping customers move past the sticking point where they get stuck in the pilot phase. And the pilot phase, we have our own AI maturity model that you're, that you're looking at here. And in our end phase where we're helping our customers get to, and we have many successful customers who are really deep into their overall uh, phases of AI maturity is to make them an AI customer, um, where they're actually creating new revenue streams, lines of business off of AI because they've gone so far through that journey. But most of the market is still stuck in the pilot phase. And this happens for a whole variety of reasons. And one of the ones that has impacted me um, or that I've been a part of the most is when I get a project, um, obviously on the business side, when I get a project and they say, hey, here's this score, here's something that's predicting X. And I say, okay, well, how does it work? And then they, they can't, we can't have that interchange. I don't understand. We can't explain it, which then drives to a lack of business adoption. And so AI clouds are helping to solve these problems, bridging that communication divide between the technical makers and the business users who are consuming AI. And we'll talk a bit about that today, about um, some of the, the products that we built that help to bridge that divide. And then our partnership coming in and helping customers really takes them through this overall uh, transformation and helps them be successful with that transformation. So one of the things we see when we come to customers is, hey, I just spent nine months and it might've been a small team of data scientists for, for a few months working on an AI project that didn't end up getting used or adopted. And what we see when that is like a data scientist starts working on a project, they're not exactly sure what the business requirements were, they're just sort of trying to figure it out and they end up having to toil on a notebook for a long time, figuring out, trying to get that model perfected over and over again. And when they're trying to get that model in production, they may run into additional hurdles working with IT, maybe they have some home-built deployment system, there's nothing that just really easily puts it in production. And then when they take those predictions, sort of what I was describing before that in terms of my interactions, when they take those predictions, they say, hey, here's, here's a score for this. They, they have trouble explaining that to the business user. And so then it's not necessarily adopted. And if that happens, you take all of this, these man hours and sometimes man years of work and they don't end up actually driving business value. And what we've seen with our AI cloud is we've had customers, I'm not saying every project takes two weeks, you'll see two weeks on the slide. That's not true of everything, but we actually have a lot of customers who have gone from concept to adopted model in the form of an AI application in under two weeks. And that's not, that's, that has been repeatable and we have numerous companies doing that. And what it really starts is now it's, it can be a data scientist, but it could also be an analyst or a developer or a data engineer who's then working with the business user from the start on a problem that's already been defined. We then have a whole set, and we'll go through them today, of no-code and auto-ML services that build really highly accurate models in, in days or even hours. So an example can be, they could build that model in hours, bring the business user in, look at how the features are, are and, the, and the feature importance coming out, have a discussion about that, reiterate on it, and get a model tuned up very quickly that the business understands. And so then when it goes into, hey, we're going to make this in production, they just one click deploy it. And then with a low code application development framework that we have, which we'll talk about H2O Wave, they can wrap that model in an application, have the business consume it right off the bat. And so they're going all the way from conception to usage and consumption in a very short period of time. And this is, this is time to value. And this is one of the main reasons we see uh, AI cloud adoption happening in all types of organizations. 
Next is once you hit that scale phase of maturity, so you saw that maturity curve, so you've gotten some value, you've proven value in the organization and, and the organization starts to grow. You're adding more layers and leadership. You have executives in the data sciences group. You start having models everywhere, right? So you have, hey, I got, I got, I might have some models running in Snowflake. We'll talk a little bit more about how we support that today. I got some development models and some of those are with H2O and some of those might be outside of H2O. I got some production models specifically in applications or in ML flow, I have some in H2O ML ops are all over and I need a single system of record to manage that. I need to know if those models are still accurate. I need to know if there's bias that's, that we're starting to see in models when they're in production. And then I always wanna be you know, continuously getting better. So these AB champion, uh, challenger champion uh, models where we're just, we're testing, do we have a better model? Do we have a better model uh, constantly? And so this is another reason we see AI clouds being adopted across the organization is you have time to value is the first one. And then this is management at scale uh, and being able to understand an entire lineage across the model, uh, the model life cycle. And so what this might look like in a financial services example is, hey, we're, we're making the models. We then make these applications and making those applications is great, but then I put them in an app store. And I can see per different department or per different line of business, you know, the set of applications and use cases that are specific to them. So in financial services for credit cards, that might be fraud detection and consumer banking. We might be looking at personalized recommendations that enables this interchange again and a closer connection between uh, the technical makers and the business, business users who are consuming AI within the organization. Okay, so what is the H2O AI cloud? Sort of an overview of like, why do we see adoption? Why is, this, why is there so much hype about um, AI in general and trying to push towards a you know, better workbench, a better toolkit uh, across organizations? You know, wh what does ours look like and what's in it? Okay, so we organize everything we do around making AI, operating that AI, and then innovating with it uh, to have it consumed by, by the business and adding value. Okay, and all of that together helps us to democratize and accelerate AI within an organization while maintaining trust and confidence so that you're not making a mistake or taking undue risk while you're going and making AI in a more democratized manner and at higher scale. So we really wanna balance making great AI and then operating it and managing it correctly to ensure business, again, business risk is minimized. So we're gonna run through everything in here. We got H203, H2O driverless AI, H2O hydrogen torch, H2O document AI. We have Wave, uh, H2O AI feature store, MLOps, uh, the H2O AI app store, and then a bunch of industry uh, pre-built applications that we've built. We'll also talk about the flexible architecture we have so you know where to run the H2O AI cloud and how it could work within your current uh, existing environment. Okay, H2O3, this is our open source distributed machine learning. This is the product that made H2O famous. Uh, what, it, what it does an amazing job of is it makes distributed machine learning simple. And so we support a really broad range of algorithms, supervised algorithms and unsupervised algorithms and even some text analytics. Okay. And then there's native clients for both Python and R. So you can work with the familiar languages and IDEs that you have. You can use the most popular uh, machine learning algorithms that are out there. And then it's very easy to go and move that into a distributed in-memory environment. So you just load, you load the data into a distributed memory pool, and then you're working on that, um, on that data within that memory pool. So it's very fast and you can scale it across multiple nodes. And we've done the work to make sure that that's really easy to do. Okay. What that allows you to do is work with big data. So really big data sets, there's no sampling, you're not making approximations. Um, you don't have to write any code to go from a single node to that cluster. Okay. And then when you're done with that output, you're gonna get something that we, that, that's, that we call Mojo. And so this is a model optimized object that you can really run anywhere. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the places you can run that. We showed that slide earlier about all the places a model can live that you have to manage. Um, but that Mojo is a deployment ready artifact coming straight out of H203. And then we also have a package for automatic machine learning um, within H203. This is one of the reasons why it's so popular 
And it's really the standard for any type of distributed machine learning that's going on across any organization. You know, when we talk to our customers and we say, hey, are you guys using H2O? The answer is almost always yes. Uh, and we see H203 used for all these uh, large data use cases. Now, H2O driverless AI, this is our award-winning auto ML product. Um, it really focuses on, uh, on time, talent, and trust across an organization so that models can be built much more quickly. They're built in a way where they're already utilizing the best practices that we've learned through years and years of working with customers and optimizing models for a whole range of use cases. And then being able to dive really deep into those models to ensure that we have trust in them when we're putting them into production and that we can also explain them to business users. So how does it work? Similar, you can take data from really any source and you're gonna load that and drag and drop it into H2O driverless AI. It has a range of capabilities. Vinod will be showing some of that later in the demo uh, to, to help you understand, dive into the data. We do automatic visualization and many other items to help you look. You can do, you can do some items. It'll handle missing values. It'll show you data shape. It'll help you understand outliers. Uh, and then we have a whole set of recipes you can run against that um, for a set of transformations and so forth to help get the data ready for machine learning. Then with the automatic model optimization that we do, it will iterate across thousands of possible models. It will engineer features itself and then run those back through all of these different um, algorithms to find the best combination of feature and algorithm for that. And then again, it will output a model that's deployment ready and can be run anywhere. And with its integration into a product we'll, call, we'll, we'll cover later, H2O ML Ops, you can just one click that into deployment. All right, so why is H2O driverless AI the one getting chosen for auto ML? Well, first and foremost, it comes down to accuracy for a broad range of use cases. The, our automated feature engineering combined with our genetic algorithm is just producing really outstanding models very quickly. Uh, on the flexibility side, it's really highly extensible and configurable. Users can completely control and augment driverless AI by writing their own workflows, models, or scores. And then the H2O models are already deployment ready, which I already talked about and can run anywhere. On the trust side, again, we have a suite of automated techniques that help to explain the models. So again, you're, you're in, you can see how it's working. You can understand what's driving um, the model in a whole range of different scenarios. And then we also simulate scenarios ourselves so that you can, it helps to prevent overfitting. And then it also checks the models for robustness. So we're not just always looking at, okay, well, uh, is this the most accurate model, which we could get to by overfitting? Um, or we want it to be a really strong, robust model that's built well, leveraging all the best practices of the internal expertise, and then also still be highly accurate and then flexible to deploy into your environment. H2O Hydrogen Torch, this is our no-code deep learning product uh, that we launched uh, a few quarters ago. We're seeing great traction off of this product. You know, the, the, the whole problem is, look, there's a lot of this unstructured data, whether it's in uh, images or video or audio or text, um, but the talent to be able to go in and tune all the parameters and build the models in all these cases um, isn't aligned to the amount of data that there is. And so this is our effort to go and democratize deep learning and bring deep learning to all data scientists and even non-data scientists to be able to build these types of models. Okay, so what we've done is we've optimized around a certain uh, set of problem types and we keep expanding these. So through the expertise on our team, we have a group. So you basically just select, hey, I'm gonna be doing a classification problem for images. And then you're gonna upload, we'll talk about how that works. Um, uh, the set of the set of images that that you'd be using and then you're going to train the model and then you can call that model as an endpoint and start using it so from a text perspective we support classification and regression we also support token classification span prediction sequence to sequence sequence and metric learning and then on the images and video side again classification regression and then we also do object detection semantic segmentation and metric learning and then what's new is audio. So we, right now we support classification and regression for audio, and we're continuing to add to this list. And so if you guys could go into the chat or the right now Q&A, if you let us know, hey, here's other ones that, that 
we would like you guys to support. That'd be great feedback for us to get. Okay, that's number one. Two is uh, if you have projects upcoming, we'd like to know like what does your next project look like? You know, are you gonna which ones of these are are the problem sets you'd be working on? And that just helps us to focus and ensure uh, we're delivering for you guys as much as possible. Okay, what's what's really different? Well, number one, the no code framework, which we talked about. So you can build these really highly accurate, uh, robust deep learning models without writing a line of code. Uh, we support a broad range of problem types and those best practices from what our grandmasters have learned working on these types of problems for many years are built directly into those problem types. Um, and then we enable, not only do we provide a, a optimal model parameter, we also enable customers to go in and you can iterate and you can still control elements of the experiment to ensure you're getting to the results and you're able to still tune in the models that you're working with. And then again, it's very easy and flexible to deploy, which you'll see is common across all of our products. All right. Another one of the engines we have to make AI is H2O Document AI. And this helps, this is all around building intelligent document models. So we similar solution space, there's a huge number of documents out there that we wanna understand and process and manage. And so what the product does is it provides a, initially a, a user experience where you can pull the data in and you can label it and then start and then train on uh, the labeled data. That's going to produce a set of models. And then those models are easily integratable via APIs into other workflows, data stores and applications. And then we also have built in a way for humans to be in the loop. Um, we'll talk a little bit about UCSF Health and what they did. If you saw them in the, in the pre-video, um, you got even more of that story. And we have that story on our website. You'll see that they did build a human in the loop in. So if there were errors coming out of the process, the human would correct it. That would go back into the training set. They'd retrain it. And the model would get better and better and better, as it is not machine learned, but machine learning. Uh, this has worked very, very well for them uh, around the very large number of faxes they receive every year. So traditionally with optical character recognition, that really works for extracting information from documents where the template doesn't change and the organization has control that the template won't change. And there are some use cases like that and Document AI does a great job on those use cases. Um, but where it's really different is that it can take for any use case where the document varies a lot, such as medical referrals, we'll talk about in a moment, supply chain contracts, purchase orders, where you're gonna get a lot of different formats that these documents come in. We can help recognize from the format, even though it's different, what type of document it is. And then based on what type of document it is, what actions to take in terms of what information to pull and where to put it, and then some workflow elements later and that's all built into H2O Document AI, making it an amazing choice for all these use cases where the traditional methods of doing this either manually or with OCR are producing, you know, are, are either really expensive or producing really poor results. So at UCSF, what they did is they said, look, we, get, we got 1.4 million faxes coming in each year and we're having to deal with these manually and they had more traditional solutions, but they're having to put a lot of manual effort in on top of that. And what they ended up doing instead is say, look, maybe, maybe we can do this, maybe we can't. Let's see if let's see if we can do this with H2O. Um, as Bob said over in the quote on the left, some in the industry told us that it couldn't be done. And so they were, we were able to work with them, use document AI, we're able to handle a very wide variety of templates of the 1.4 million faxes coming in, find the referrals. The referrals also had multiple different templates, and then build that straight into their workflow for then now when a doctor says, hey, we, we need to have this person refer to a different doctor um, and they're sending that via fax, that whole process is, is automated. And so individuals are getting referred much quickly, much more quickly. So yes, when we look at the value, we're like, oh, they, they saved 25,000 hours of staff time. And that's great. You know, we also look at the value saying, well, now we're actually able to connect patients who need care to the doctor who can provide that care much more quickly. Uh, and so that's, that, that's the, those are the, the ways where I think AI is really, really adding societal value um, and, and that we're able to help organizations do that through the products that we're making in our AI cloud. Okay, once you made the model, 
we're still in the make section here. We, we want to make AI applications. And so H2O Wave is a low code AI app dev framework. So what happens today is we have people who make AI and then we have the people who consume AI. And if I want to bridge that divide with an application and I'm a, I know Python really well, I now need to coordinate with other application developers or front end developers from an HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or other type of perspective to write those elements of the application, which ends up slowing progress. I need to sit in meetings versus spending time making, and then I'm trying to bridge this divide. And this is where H2O Wave comes in. You basically take that out. You can build these sophisticated real-time applications that our business users can use to see everything that's coming in. And you can do all of that in Python with H2O Wave. So I'm going to have Vinod jump in here, and he's going to demo what's possible with an H2O Wave app. Um, and then we'll cover some things about you know, why H2O Wave is great and why we see a lot of uh, customers adopting it right now. I right, Thank you, Reed. Let me uh, share my screen over here quick. Okay, I'm going to show a couple of examples of what's possible with the show wave. Right? So um, for folks who have not known about this wave, it's basically a low-code app development framework. And um, for data scientists who might be familiar with, let's say, with R Shiny or Streamlit on the Python side, it, this will be like, you know, this will maybe feel like a much, much more powerful and more flexible uh, framework to build your rich applications, data rich applications. Uh, so I have a couple of examples. First is basically a hospital occupancy simulator app that we built for some of our large healthcare providers. What this allows us to do essentially is to uh, look at a particular metro or county and for that predict the COVID cases or occupancy or uh, admissions in the next few days or weeks. Um, so for example, I can here, I'm, it's looking at California Alameda County, I can go and change it, let's say, uh, pick a different county, Napa County, for example, and I can see the real time uh, predictions being updated um, and you can see what the change in the different um, uh, occupancies, length of states, uh, ICUs, et cetera. I can also very easily simulate, for example, this is the base simulation, base rate that we know from the data, but let's say a particular hospital wants to change the rate, they're saying that, hey, we are seeing really high admissions and occupancies. Can you run a simulation for us? You can do that very easily, change the model, and then model goes and updates this. Right? So it's a real simple example, but a very rich application that can be used directly by uh, hospital providers. Now, another example, which is basically a transaction fraud one. So this is an application that can be used by, let's say, a bank uh, or financial services where they want their agents or risk analysts to be able to look at transactions as they're coming in, flag them as fraud or fraud or like you know highly suspicious, and then have them inspected. So here you can see transactions as they're coming in with the probability, really high probability of fraud. Right. So I can go pick up a transaction. Um, I can see why the model thinks it's a fraud. It's giving the reason codes, for example, it's saying that, that it's it's fraud because of these particular reasons. Let me make the screen a little bigger. So. I can look at the most important factors. I can look at what the distribution is as compared to the common age group and other different uh, demographic patterns. I can also go and diagnose the model, for example, right? I can change the type of model I want to use, change the type of score. I can optimize it for a different parameter, for example. Um, I can change the fraud threshold. I can do all this piece of same. So as you can see, um, and as I do that, all these get updated. Um, the nice thing about this whole app is that a lot of these components you see are widgets that are available natively. So you don't, as a data scientist, have to write front-end code to do this. You can generate these rich visualizations and interactive uh, elements very easily from the uh, Wave uh, toolkit itself. So hopefully you'll uh, take it for a spin and um, uh, we'll look forward to see what you do with it. Or do you read? All right, thanks, Vinod. You know, as you can see, you can build really powerful applications very quickly with H2O Wave. Again, do it all in Python. The data streams in in real time. It can update in real time. It's very good at that. It runs very quickly. Uh, so you can build these really um, powerful applications quickly, and you can deploy them very uh, right out of the App Store, and they can run anywhere as well. So very flexible in terms of the architecture. All right, moving over, that, so that was everything around Make. We just covered H203, driverless AI, hydrogen torch, document AI, and H20 Wave. And moving over to uh, Operate, we're going to cover Feature Store and MLOps next. So the H20 AI Feature Store, you know, one of the reasons we built this product is we kept running into customers and they'd say, well, we've built, done all this work to build these features. We've done all the data prep, we created the feature engineering pipeline, we now use these features in a set of models, but they're siloed and other data scientists can't find them. And with the H2I feature store, 
we pull all that together. So now all these great features that the data scientists are using, we call this internally, it's like the water cooler for data scientists, come around and they can see the features that others have built to solve uh, similar other problems around the organization and then use those to improve the model. And so this is a product that we co-created with AT&T. And I talked to Mark Austin, their VP of data scientists over there pretty frequently. And he, he's like, there's almost, I don't think there, he just did it in another meeting last week where he was talking about the data scientists were working on a problem for a couple of years. And he's like, oh, let's just, let's just go over here. Let's go shopping. Let's go shopping. He calls it shopping in the feature store. And they went over there and they spent, a, they spent an hour or two searching through the feature store, looking for features, looking at all the metadata that's associated with them. And sure enough, every time he comes back, he's like, we increased the accuracy of that model by 17%. We increased the accuracy of this model by 35%. We increased the accuracy of this model by 45%. It's, you know, it's a continual basis of they're going in, they're finding these additional features, they're reusing all of this incredible work that the data scientists have always done, have already done and applying them to other business problems that are occurring uh, in the group. So uh, really excited about, uh, about this innovation for the company. Uh, it's a composable architecture, so you can bring in streaming or batch data. We've already have pre-built integrations with driverless AI, Databricks, uh, Snowflake, Apache Spark, and a whole set so that these engineering pipe, feature engineering pipelines you've already built will work directly with Feature Store. And if you have one where we don't have a pre-built integration, we have APIs and you can integrate with it quite easily. Um, and then we have an online and an offline engine, and then you just connect that over into the applications that you're already running, and you can also use it for real-time inference. So why the H2O AI feature store? Number one, scale. You know, we, we built this with AT&T to handle some of the largest data sets that exist out there. Um, they, they do many petabytes a day over their network, just to give you, you know, I, I think everyone would have, has a good sense on the call of how big uh, AT&T is, but it's built to handle terabyte scale data in the offline. The performance online, so when we do on the online data store, is engineered to do sub-millisecond latency for real-time inferencing. Security is first and foremost, and the design is a P0, so it, it honors all data and access rules for full-fledged perm permission, and it also does encryption of the data and does masking for sensitive features, and that's all supported natively within the product. And again, it's really flexible in terms of the clients and the feature engineering pipelines that can integrate with. All right, H2O MLOps is what we use for model registry, deployment, scoring, and monitoring. And so, see, that these are the core. These are core problems when when organizations get to scale, which is the deployment needs to be seamless, very quick. But when they do that, they need to make sure that they can monitor and understand not just the standard software monitoring, but you know, it, how is the model performing? Is it drifting? Is are the, is there bias coming into the model? So there's other types of monitoring we want to use on those models. And then there's struggle with lifecycle management is a understanding, you know, the, is it maintaining accuracy? And then if we've updated the app, then what's the lineage going back, which is related then to governance, which is, can we see the entire lineage of how the model's gotten built? And then if we inserted a new model from a champion challenger uh, perspective, how do we then also have lineage back and connecting that version like V1, V2, V3 of those models all the way back. So governance becomes a really important item. And so, this is, how, this is how we've built H2O MLOps. It supports a whole range of frameworks, not just H2O, like PyTorch, TensorFlow. So other types of models work with H2O MLOps. Uh, we have a management and registry. Uh, we have deployments and scoring. So you, again, you can deploy it in a, in a single model or A-B testing or champion challenger. You can deploy it for synchronous, asynchronous or batch scoring. Um, and then you have a whole range of environments, whether you're doing that dev prod or, or some other type of custom environment that you've built. And then on the monitoring side, we monitor, we monitor for feature drift, accuracy, bias. And then we have a whole set of other operational metrics. And then we also allow you to set some custom thresholds within those operational metrics to help, manage, help with the management and make it even easier. And then via APIs, we have tie-ins with a whole set of AI applications, alerts and messaging, and then other analytics tools. And our customers are choosing MLOps because number one, it's, it's open and interoperable. Um, it's integrated with a broad set of AI tools and you can score models anywhere. So you can score the models directly in MLOps, 
but because of the flexibility of the mojo that you were talking about earlier, that's our model output. Um, and we'll, we'll also talk a little bit about how you do this in Snowflake is you could score directly in an environment like Snowflake and still govern and monitor the models from H2O MLOps. Um, we have the widest range of deployment options that I was just talking about. And then on, uh, we have enterprise gate governance. So that end-to-end -end model lineage and that identity and access control as well as model lifecycle management is required for governance at scale um, as organizations grow in their AI endeavors. Moving over to the innovate side, on the app store, really what, we, what we've done here is it enables organizations to publish, share, and collaborate on AI apps to drive business value. So the AI makers, they create and they publish the H2O Wave apps. You know, we already, we already talked about H2O Wave. And then the AI users can go and find those apps, and then they can deploy them very simply and run them and use them. And so the app store is this area of not just finding, but again, it helps you to host and run the applications as well and provides that bridge between the AI user, uh, sorry, the AI maker and the AI user. We've also built a huge range of AI applications. So between things that help with data sciences best practices around model validation, um, adversarial model robustness testing, and then on the financial side around things like home insurance churn or credit card risk, uh, and Vinod was, was demoing transaction fraud. On the healthcare side, we were looking at a COVID-19 forecast. So things are on chest anomaly detection. So what we're doing is in all of these, there's a range of applications that customers can come in for use cases that have already been worked on and have a huge head start in using that in their organization uh, to drive business value even faster. Now, one of the key things about the H2 AI cloud is how flexible the infrastructure is. So from an API perspective, uh, we, have, we have integrations uh, and deep partnership with some of the, comp some of the companies you see on the left. Uh, we also can just integrate with 200 uh, plus data sources out of the box that we already have pre-built integrations with. And then via APIs, you can integrate very easily with other business applications. Uh, and then we just talked about how to integrate with H2O Wave specifically. Uh, we're cloud agnostic, you can run on any cloud, any Kubernetes environment. So you can set up environments that are in also Kubernetes on-premise if you're running your own cloud uh, and scaling elastically that way as well. There's also two offerings. So we have a fully managed offering. This is where we handle the infrastructure. We handle all of the updates. You're always on the latest version of, of our products and you're just focusing on making and we're handling all of the undifferentiated heavy lifting, all of the muck to allow you guys to focus. Um, that's over in the fully managed cloud. In some organizations, they want full control over their environment. And so that's in the hybrid cloud. So they, they have full control over how they wanna set that up. They can achieve different, you know, whatever their compliant, uh, compliance needs are within that environment. And they have that choice between, I wanna run in this specific cloud or I wanna run on-prem. Um, they can, they absolutely can do that. One of the, you saw this slide earlier in a slightly different context, but in terms of flexible infrastructure, because of the object that we're creating and because of some of the partnerships and other software we've written on top of the object, you can really run and score these models just about anywhere. And so we're then able to take the ones that are directly running in ML ops, but you can also have models running in multiple places and then we're scoring those and we have insight into what's going on to help from a uh, management and a governance perspective. This also allows us to do AI on the edge. So this is in terms of building a model. We can build models that run in any Java environment. They support real-time um, real scoring. They'll return that with sub millisecond latency and then the mo models can be built, can be really lightweight to run at a whole range of different devices. So we're alluding to Snowflake for a couple slides here. What happens with Snowflake is you can, you can train the model directly within the Snowflake UI. You can take that trained model, it's part of the AI cloud, and you can move it, the, the scoring artifact, actually directly into Snowflake and you can score directly in Snowflake. So if you, are, if you have Snowflake, you're a Snowflake user, uh, we have deep integrations with them. We have a whole page on our website for you to go if you want to learn more and go deeper. We also have a session in a couple weeks 
um, that Eric on our team is going to run where we're going to drive deeper into our Snowflake integration. So, so stay tuned for that or go back to the Make with H2O page and register for that session if you haven't already. Here's an example of that, of, do, of, of doing the training and scoring within Snowflake is direct mailers is by using H2O, they saw over 60% in performance gauge and they were saw 40% improvement in their utilization of their resources. And most important to them was how much, how much faster they were able to access their data in terms of the data that they were, they were processing uh, with machine learning. We saw a similar with Infutor where uh, Gary Walter, their CEO said that H2O reduced their AI inference costs on Snowflake by 55X and that their partnership and support has made the integration that much more seamless and easier to lever. So if you're using Snowflake, again, it's something you can go try out. Uh, and um, I think you'll see, the, you'll see the same type of performance and efficiency gains uh, working by, having, uh, by being able to train within the UI and being able to score directly in Snowflake. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna pause for a brief poll. Uh, and then we're going to switch over uh, and we're going to jump into an end-to-end -end demo with Finod. So we want to understand because we're running these every week, uh, we have a whole, uh, we have a lot to cover, is what do you want to learn about? So if you could just take a minute, answer what you want to learn about. Um, next, we're going to be focused on those topics. Already what's coming up next is we have NLP next week. Um, I'll cover a little bit more about an innovation day we're running July 14th. The week after that, we're going to be covering Snowflake, uh, and then we start our accuracy masterclass. So uh, we have a range coming in, and then we're going to keep adjusting those based on feedback from the community about what you guys want to learn about, and then we'll hold these sessions. Um, we're also going to be experimenting with formats on these sessions too, so it's not just you know us. You know, we do have a lot to cover in just terms of the breadth of the platform on this session, but we'll also be breaking it up and trying to do a little bit more discussion groups and some other things and some future versions that we're working on. Okay, great. Do we share those out? It looks like we got NLP is up at four is is one of the highest here. We got a, we got a, other ones that are pretty close to next there, which um, unsupervised machine learning and feature transformation. So those are the top three. So NLP is the next session. If you're on here and you haven't registered for that, please attend. Um, and we'll take the note of uh, feature transformations, but we are going to cover that in our accuracy masterclass. Um, and it's the second part of that. So that should be up in about six weeks ish. We should be uh, covering that topic and um, unsupervised, we need to add to the list. So thanks for, thanks for that feedback. All right, Vinod. All right. Thank you, Reed. Let's go ahead and um, jump into the demo real quick. Let me start with the App Store. So uh, when you come to the AI Cloud, and we talk about all the pieces that AI, uh, Reed mentioned, but um, in that huddle, this is what you'll get. And you sign in, you go to short.ai slash free or free trial, sign up for our account. You log in, you'll see something like this. This is basically the App Store. Um, uh, it has the App Store, the AI Cloud, the Cloud Console, and all the AI engines that uh, Reed mentioned earlier, right? So obviously you have, you can go in, navigate into the App Store, take a look at all the different apps that are available. You can take one of these and start working on them, or you can come and launch with the uh, machine learning workflows, which is what we will do today. If in the interest of time, we're gonna do a very, very quick workflow of what it means uh, to start from a data set, go all the way to modeling and then deploy the model into production, right? So Azure Drive is your place to start off all quick this and you know, have a tab open to this. Basically you come to Azure Drive, you can see all the data sets that you have available. It's kind of your sort of pocket S3 on, on the AI cloud. Uh, you can obviously import data from a whole bunch of different sources. And we have like over 200 data, different data sources like we mentioned earlier. Um, you can also configure one of these connectors. So if you want to basically uh, import your data from, oh, let me refresh this. If you want to import your data from, let's say, um, Snowflake, which we mentioned earlier, right? So you can add your credentials, you can put in a login and save those credentials. And the next time you come in, it'll be available over here. Once the data is in here, you can obviously go look at the data sets that are available. We have a demo, bunch of demo data sets available. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into Travel SAI. And the way you can dodge Travel SAI is you can go and launch this quick start over here. Um, and that will basically mean you launch a Travel instance for you. You can also launch an H2 instance very easily, but um, we'll come to our Travel instance real quick. And once you are here, this is the Travel SAI for folks who have seen this before. If you are new to this, um, you'll see basically a bunch of tabs on top, projects, data sets, experiments, and so on. 
So I'm going to start with the project step. So you have a project, you typically start with the project, create a project, we'll add your data sets to that and then uh, start your experiments, right? In this case, we already have a project in place. Uh, one way, um, just to mention how you would import data into Driverless AI, you have multiple sources. Uh, the easiest way, like in, if you're an AI cloud, is to go hit this HTO drive link. So you can see those data sets that we saw earlier in the drive. Those will all show up over here, same data sets, right? And you can import all of them one at a time. You can also use one of these connectors directly to pull in data. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna I already put a data set over here, so I'm not gonna run that again. But once the data set is in here, you will see those data sets showing up. You can do obviously a couple of things. You can um, quickly look at the details. Um, you can see what the data looks like, uh, the different columns in there, uh, the data types, some min, max, median, some statistics. You can also look at the raw rows themselves to see if the data makes sense. This is exactly Exactly, uh, is it what you are hoping to pull? In this case, we have a telco churn data set, a very popular open source uh, Kaggle data set that, will, that has a bunch of information about the subscribers. Uh, and the goal is to predict whether someone is going to churn or not based on all their uh, subscriber, subscription pattern, patterns. Now, a couple of things you can do over here. You can um, start visualizing, you can uh, predict and do it. But before that, you can also transform this data set. So we have a couple of options to do this. First is you can you upload a data recipe and we have a whole bunch of recipes and you can write your own recipe. Recipes are basically just Python code that you can use to transform a data set. You can also apply an existing recipe. So for example, I have a data preview recipe that I can hit and that data, it's a very, very simple recipe. All it does is uh, picks up the first four columns and then shows that for me. And I can just go and look at that particular uh, preview, right? So apply a transformation and that can be done. Um, let me go back over here to the original data set. I can also uh, apply live code. This is nice because I can write basically Python and Pandas code to uh, transform my uh, data set. And once I'm done, I can save that transformation into a recipe for future purposes as well. So it's really nice, easy to do data transformation over here. Let's close that out. Uh, let's go and actually build a model. So I have actually created the training test data set over here. So I'm gonna just go and click that and start to build a model. Uh, when I hit predict, I get this option. It tells me, okay, um, it automatically, uh, it's picking supervised and unsupervised. I can obviously change which type of modeling I want to do. In this case, we are doing supervised learning. We're going to predict whether someone's going to churn or not. The target column in this case is the one at the bottom, churn. And I'm going to use this in the, the classic automobile mode. I'm going to let it, the machine figure out everything. So you can see it figures out the, based on the parameters, it says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's the kind of models I'm going to run. Here's a kind of feature changing I'm going to, it's building basically a plan of how it's going to solve this problem, right? You can obviously tweak this. You can change everything. If you go to expert settings, which I won't go today, you have a whole host of settings if you're an expert to tweak it. But if you want to just let the machine do it, AutoML will do all the work for you, right? It picks up the right accuracy time and interpreter settings. It picks the right score for you. You can change that, of course. You can pick a different score if you want to. And then hit run. So in this case, I'm just going to hit run. I'm going to let the machine do all the work and then I'm going to hit run, right? Let it start building a model. Um, it's going to do a few things. First, it's going to check the schema. It's going to check if there are any issues in the data. Uh, we call it basically pitfall avoidance, right? It checks that there, there are leakages in the data, there are drifts in the data, there are missing values, for example. It does all that work for you, right? Preprocessing work for you, make sure that the data is actually good. If it has some issues, give you warnings or at least go and fix those problems for you. And after it's done, it starts building models. It starts, uh, you can see the first model is showing up. And we'll go run through a whole bunch of iterations and doing iterations, it'll do some, it'll do some feature engineering or try to create new features, transform your existing features, uh, make it more uh, compatible for machine learning, try to e-code as much signal as it can, right? And the goal is, oh, after a few iterations, get the best model possible with highest accuracy. Now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go into an experiment, same data set I ran earlier, a classic cookbook style. We're just gonna go this telco webinar data set, same experiment. I finished this a little while earlier, right? So I ran this, it finished experimenting, it ran about the eight or nine iterations. After that, it figured that it was not really uh, getting any lift, so it closed the experiment. And you can start seeing what the different top parameters were, right? So it's saying that the contract of a person is probably the most important feature that determines whether someone's going to or not. It also tells you if they, they did contact tech support, um, then uh, or the response to tech support uh, is an important factor. That's interesting. So we kind of have a good sense, but that tells you that. So it tells you all the information. Now, I want to see more about this model, right? I want to see actually what is this model actually doing, right? So I want to go first interpret this model. So I have a bunch of uh, ability to show interpretations. I can also run interpretations, but I'm going to run, just show the interpretations which I already ran on you. So what Dravlers did for you is basically ran about 14 different interpretation techniques. Uh, these include a bunch of direct techniques, some surrogate models, some um, other techniques like bias detection, sensitive analysis, 
And this is a, a rich set of uh, analysis to help you actually find out what the actual model is doing, right? Uh, I'm just gonna pick one over here, right? So this is the Shapley values and the original features. It tells me uh, what we saw earlier, right? So contract, tenure, internet service, or not, online security. These are the top parameters that tell me whether someone is gonna churn or not. The nice thing is I can actually go and pick up like a single row. So I can say, give me row number 100, right? If I know subscriber number 100, I can go search for that particular person and I can see how that person's uh, values differ as it can compared to the global model, right? So in this case, this person has a um, uh, different value for the two-year contract. They have different values for all these, right? So they are very different from the average user, but that also tells me why they are interesting. I can take a look at that to see make sense if this person is unique or not, right? I can obviously run disparate impact analysis. This tells me whether my model is biased against certain sensitive features. And that's really nice to see, right? So I can go and see, hey, um, I wanna make sure that the model is not biased against gender, right? So I can quickly see, in this case, it's telling me that the model actually isn't, right? So it's saying that there is no bias. It seems to be the model seems to be fair. But if it is not fair, it will show up over here and then you can take some corrective action. So that's nice. Um, I'm just gonna jump back to the experiment real quick. Um, then just of time. Um, one other thing you can do, which is really interesting, is you can actually go and look at the individual recipe. So if I click this, it'll actually create, take this particular experiment. And I'm going to just show you, jump to the preview of that. It'll actually create a recipe out of that, meaning that this is a, a Python code that the model generated of it. And that you can use this code to run that experiment again and again. You can run it in a notebook and you can recreate the entire settings. All the settings for travelers are all over here. So that's really nice if you want to put it into your sort of CI CD pipeline, for example, right? So that's really nice. Um, now let's go back to deploying the model, right? So this is the key part, right? So to deploy a model, I have once it's in my project, so you can see this is my project. Uh, the data sets are over here. These are the two experiments. I have linked them up. Now let me jump to my MLOps tab. So this is where I go to MLOps, go to all the projects. Uh, four projects listed over here. The project that we are most interested in is the Telco Chamon, which we just saw earlier. So let me go hit this project. I'm inside the project. Let me make the screen a little bigger so it's visible. So I can see that there are basically um, two experiments in that project, like we saw earlier, right? Two experiments. Um, there are, oh, there's only one model um, to know to register a model. Basically, I go to an experiment. I click on the experiment. I can see that there is one model in this, that this experiment has a model. I can now register this uh, model into MLOps. And that's really an important step, right? So this allows me to basically say, I want to bring this model in. I want to use this for uh, model management or model deployment. So I'm going to register this as a new model. I'm going to call it Telco Webinar Model. Oops. I'll leave the description blank and register this. Now my model is su successfully registered. So now I go to my models tab, I can see both those models showing up, right? Now this is nice. So I can see the model, I can look at when the model is uh, registered. Now, uh, what the third step is basically now being able to deploy that model. So I already have one model deployed. I'm going to create a new deployment. So I'm going to call it uh, Taco Webinar, just keeping the same name. I'm going to pick the mode. In this case, it's a single model. I can also have the ability to do hybrid models, but we can get to it later. I'm going to pick the select model, right? So select model gives me the two models that I have available. I'm going to pick the webinar one. That's the one we are deploying. I can pick the deployment tab, whether it's real time or batch. We'll pick real time. We pick the environment. In this case, I'm going to call it prod. And then I can pick a bunch of parameters, right? I can pick the security level. I can pick the runtime artifact. Uh, this is critical, so I'm going to pick the artifact. In this case, I want the Mojo to be deployed. Mojo is basically H2 artifact, which is optimized for scoring. I'm going to pick the Mojo runtime. Um, and our nice thing you can see is there's a whole bunch of different runtimes that are supported, right? So we can support third-party models as well very easily. We can support Python scoring pipeline. So any type of model you bring it to MLOps, you can deploy very easily. I'm going to leave the security, in this case, no security, and everything else is optional. So I'm going to hit create deployment. And now it's going to start to deploy that model. So as you can see, it's going to, um, it's still pending and take a few minutes. What it does is it starts uh, spinning up a pod, putting the rest in point. Uh, in the interest of time, let's pick the one that we deployed earlier and tell you what it looks like. So you can see this model has been deployed, it was deployed a little earlier. Right now, there are no alerts on this. This is the endpoint I can score to. I can also get a sample call request. I can go around this, I hit this call request. I can see predictions coming through, All right? Very nice. That, let me close this out and then get back to my AI cloud for a second. So that's basically what you saw. So here's what we did, right? We, we imported a data set into H2 Drive, built the model with Travelers AI. 
then we were able to deploy it with our ML ops. Um, we can do something similar with hydrogen torch as well. In, in the future sessions, we'll cover that. We have H203 coming up, so you can do that as well. So all these AI engines work similarly. You can do that work. I'm just going to show one last thing before we end the session, which is I have these notebooks now. So this is nice. So I can basically have a Jupyter notebook running in, as an IDE in my cloud. And what I'm going to do is I can open up one of these um, notebook instances and I have basically an end-to-end -end workflow. So all the things we did in the GUI can all be dri driven through the notebook. So basically this is this one notebook, I'm not going to run the whole thing, allows you to basically create an AI engine, basically, which is basically launch a travel engine, launch driverless AI, import a data set, the same Kelko Chan data set, uh, run an automated experiment, just like we did for the GUI, and then deploy that model to MLOps, connect to MLOps, get the deploy, create the deployment, view the information about the deployment. So all the things we did from the GUI, you can do it from the Python notebook as well, right? Or from Python client. And what this means is that you can now take this entire notebook or pipeline and put it into CICD. So if you want to automate, uh, automate this whole process or programmatically control your modeling workflow, you can do that as well. So you basically went from uh, data set creation to all the way to model books. And one thing we didn't create is the feature store, right? So you can also import from feature store, build models, deploy, and do the internet. So that's in a very, very quick nutshell what AI Cloud allows you to do, right? So it's a very rich platform. It, it, is a full, it has a full ID for building models, both with the code first interface, also with no code interface and data scientists and business users and data engineers, app developers, they can all come in, collaborate very easily. It's a collaborative workflow with an entire environment. And all these apps are uh, helping you do uh, achieve sort of you know, different objectives at different parts of your AI life cycle. With that, I'm gonna hand it back to Reed to close out the session. Thank you. All right, thanks, Vinod. I mean, everything Vinod just showed, you can go try yourself in our free trial. Uh, in terms of doing those those end-to-end -end workflows, we have a tutorial in there. Uh, it'll take you through you know, building a churn model, deploying it, and many of the other items that Vinod just uh, just showed. But you can make with it what you will. Um, you have open access to uh, to build and and test out all the capabilities within our cloud. And then just to leave you with, we have a bunch of upcoming events. Um, one of the big ones is July 14th. We'll be hosting our HO Innovation Day. So go check that out. Uh, please register. We're going to be covering everything that we've launched in the last quarter and doing all the new innovation. We're also going to be uh, sitting down uh, and talking with our CEO and a set of customers in that about what they're seeing and doing uh, with, the, with, um, uh, with H2O. And then we have a whole other set that we talked about. We got NLP coming up uh, next week. Uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a document processing meetup in Singapore, uh, London meetup, and then we're going to talk about Snowflake um, and, and choosing the right metric from an accuracy masterclass in a couple of weeks. Um, the week after uh, that we'll be posting, we made the decision on we're going to have uh, H2O Document AI and getting started with H2O Document AI as the focus. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, watch emails coming through about the program uh, and sign up for that one. Just want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, really appreciate it. And again, if you have questions, something comes up, let us know and uh, and we'll uh, we'll get we'll get it all sorted out for you.